pasca meninjau beberapa fasilitas kesehatan di Palembang, Presiden Joko Widodo beserta para menterinya mengunjungi Provinsi Jambi. Di Jambi, Jokowi melihat langsung sekolah negeri yang sudah mengadaptasi sistem kelas aman asap. Kita akan bergabung dengan Yarnes Foni di sana. Yarnes, mengapa Presiden memilih datang ke wilayah suku anak dalam? Ya benar sekali Rory bahwa Presiden datang langsung ke tempat suku anak dalam Ini merupakan suku asli dari Provinsi Jambi di mana tadi Presiden juga langsung mendatangi dan juga bertemu dengan para tetua-tetua adat dari suku anak dalam Kami perhatikan Presiden Jokowi kini ambangi warga Salorangun Provinsi Jambi setelah empat kali gagal datang ke Jambi Presiden datang dari kota Jambi ke Kabupaten Sarolangun gunakan helikopter dan turun langsung menyapa warga masyarakat Sarolangun. Agenda Presiden salah satunya di Jambi adalah untuk bertemu dengan suku anak dalam. Salah satu suku asli masyarakat Jambi yang tinggal sederhana namun kini terpapar kabut asap karena tinggal dengan kediaman yang terbuka ditambah banyak anak dari suku dalam yang sakit ispa dan dievakuasi serta diungsikan. Diketahui di Jambi hingga kini masih ada titik-titik api walaupun tidak banyak dan keadaannya biasanya pekat pada pagi hari. Presiden didampingi Menteri Sosial, Menteri Kesehatan, Sekretaris Kabinet dan juga Menteri PMK. Selain itu Presiden juga memantau rumah yang diberikan Kementerian Sosial untuk orang rimba. Presiden juga mengajak diskusi temanggung atau kepala suku anak dalam dan beberapa tokoh adat suku anak dan dari pertemuan itu Presiden akan mengatur pengairan listrik di desa Bukit Suban, Kecamatan Air Hitam ini. Berikut petikan wawancara Presiden Joko Widodo. Pemerintah harus memberikan perhatian karena apapun hmm, apa itu lingkungan mereka yang lama sudah sekarang berubah menjadi sawit menjadi ini yang apa yang perlu dikelola lagi sehingga mereka mempunyai tempat tinggal yang apa tetap tidak nomaden berpindah-pindah kemudian pendapatan mereka dari mana juga harus diikuti pendidikan saya kira tadi bagus sekali sudah Ya, Rory, selain itu juga Presiden menyempatkan diri untuk mendatangi beberapa sekolah, bahkan ada salah satu sekolah di daerah Provinsi Jambi yang saat ini memang agak unik karena bebas dari asap dari teknologi yang terbaru ditemukan. Itu yang kami perhatikan salah satunya di kota Jambi yang kami perhatikan, Sekolah Dasar Negeri 181 Kelurahan Lebak Bandung, Kecamatan Jelantung, Jambi, Jumat Siang nampak ramai karena langsung dihadiri Presiden serta beberapa menterinya. Presiden beserta Ibu Negara, Menteri Pendidikan Dasar Anies Bas dan juga hadir Menteri PMK Puan Maharani menjauh ruang kelas 3 di sekolah ini yang telah dilengkapi dengan teknologi sederhana pengaman asap. Celah-celah ventilasi di atas jendela ruangan kelas ini telah dilapisi dengan dakron yang direndam dengan air kapur. Sirkulasi udara dibantu dengan exhaust dan juga kipas angin dan nampak sehat. Teknologi sederhana buatan profesor dari ITB ini terbukti ampuh menahan asap masuk ke dalam ruangan kelas. Selain itu Presiden dan Menteri yang ikut juga membagikan buku tulis kepada para siswa yang hadir juga memberikan pengajaran beberapa kepada para anak. Menteri Budaya Pendidikan Dasar Anies Baswedan juga mengatakan bahwa hal tersebut sangat positif untuk membangun jiwa anak yang tidak mudah kalah dengan asap dan juga dapat maju. 65 sampean berarti 65 Menteri Sosial Kofifa Indah Parawansa mendatangi suku anak dalam Jambi untuk memberikan bantuan saat kabut asap karena saat ini suku anak dalam makin terkepung asap dan kebakaran hutan. Dan informasi selengkapnya kita bergabung dengan Yarnes Foni langsung dari Jambi. Ya, Yarnes seperti apa kondisi kebakaran di hutan suku anak dalam Jambi dan bantuan apa saja yang diberikan Mensos dalam kunjungannya? Ya Anissa sebenarnya kedatangan para menteri termasuk Presiden Joko Widodo adalah untuk melihat lebih dekat bagaimana sebenarnya terjadi kebakaran lahan salah satunya adalah di Provinsi Jambi diketahui di Provinsi Jambi sudah memakan korban jiwa seorang balita di daerah kota kemudian di daerah kabupaten juga ada yang meninggal karena kabut asap dan saat ini sebenarnya kunjungan para menteri ini saat ini Presiden Jokowi juga rencananya pada pukul 14 akan datang ke tempat ini tempatnya di Soralangun untuk dapat melihat suku asli dari Provinsi Jambi yakni suku anak dalam dan salah satunya yakni di Bukit Suban Kabupaten Sorolangun banyak sakit lantaran asap banyak ketahui saat ini sakit ispa diketahui Jambi juga masih ada saat ini yang sakit ispa dan telah dibuatkan rumah evakuasi 
Kami dapatkan informasi bahwa Presiden Jokowi saat ini juga telah berada di kota Jambi di Provinsi Jambu Namin namun belum sampai ke tempat ini. Dan kebakaran lahan saat ini juga masih terus terjadi. Menteri Sosial Kofifa juga mengunjungi suku anak dalam untuk menemukan hutan terbakar. Mensos Kofifa juga uh, melihat langsung bagaimana keadaan dari para warga suku pedalaman ini yang saat ini kini berpindah-pindah karena kabut asap di lahan mereka kini juga tengah terbakar. Untuk uh, menempuh jarak tepatnya di tempat saya berada ini dari kota Jambi memang masih membutuhkan waktu sekitar 6 jam lagi. Namun kami dapatkan informasi Presiden Joko Widodo uh, dan juga para menteri akan datang ke tempat ini menggunakan helikopter. Berikut petikan wawancara dari Menteri Sosial Kofifa. secara langsung dari berbagai lini ada yang berbasis sekolah ada yang berbasis layanan kesehatan ada yang berbasis rumah singgah kemudian beliau ingin cek bagaimana sebetulnya suku anak dalam ketika hutan ini terbakar atau ketika asap mengepung mereka Ya Anissa tadi juga rekan saya Gadis Bianca bisa mendapatkan gambaran bagaimana keadaan dari suku anak dalam yang saat ini memang mereka terus berpindah-pindah dengan tempat rumah yang minim namun mereka tetap berjuang untuk dapat menghindar dari kabut asap dan juga lahan mereka yang terbakar. Berikut liputannya. Pemirsa ini adalah salah satu rumah orang rimba yang mereka tinggalkan untuk mereka mengevakuasikan diri di rumah evakuasi orang rimba yang ada di perbatasan Taman Nasional Bukit 12. Mereka harus berjalan sepanjang uh, sejauh 5 km dan itu uh, kondisi tipologinya adalah naik turun bukit. Saya pun tadi mencoba untuk datang ke sini langsung dan di sepanjang perjalanan saya menemukan banyak sekali bekas be bekas pohon terbakar dan bayangkan sekeliling ini semuanya ini adalah titik api mereka tinggal di kepung titik api dan juga kabut asap dan bahkan mereka harus meninggalkan salah satu induk mereka karena uh, nenek ini tidak bisa lagi berjua, uh, berjalan ke rumah evakuasi dari Kabupaten Sarolangun Provinsi Jambi Gadis Bianca Hanindito Metro TV Ya Anissa saat ini di kota Jambi sendiri keadaannya masih cukup terang, kabut asap masih agak kurang karena jarak pandang sekitar 900 meter. Semoga hingga sore hingga malam hari nanti nah, karena tetap seperti ini hingga nanti Presiden Jokowi bisa langsung melihat uh, para warga dari uh, yang berada di daerah Kabupaten uh, Sorolangun ini. Kembali ke studio Anissa. Ya, ya Ernesfone terima kasih atas laporan Anda. Ya Ernesfone langsung melaporkan dari Jambi. My second story is about love and loss. I was lucky. I found what I loved to do early in life. Waz and I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard, and in 10 years, Apple had grown from just the two of us in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I just turned 30. And then I got fired. How can you get fired from a company you started? Well, as Apple grew, we hired someone who I thought was very talented to run the company with me. And for the first year or so, things went well. But then our visions of the future began to diverge, and eventually we had a falling out. When we did, our board of directors sided with him. And so at 30, I was out, and very publicly out. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, and it was devastating. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. I felt that I had let the previous generation of entrepreneurs down, that I had dropped the baton as it was being passed to me. I met with David Packard and Bob Noyce and tried to apologize for screwing up so badly. I was a very public failure and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. The turn of events at Apple had not changed that one bit. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love. And so I decided to start over. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful, 
was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pixar, and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. Pixar went on to create the world's first computer animated feature film, Toy Story, and is now the most successful animation studio in the world. In a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next, and I returned to Apple, and the technology we developed at Next is at the heart of Apple's current renaissance. And Lorene and I have a wonderful family together. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometime life, sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. And that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking. Don't settle.
No one will listen. Hey Martin, what's wrong? I've, I've had enough of this. Every change I've suggested is knocked down. It's impossible to change anything around here. And maybe your suggestions are no good? That's nonsense. You know why it happens. Everybody knows. It's because people resist change. Resist, 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 resist. You are wrong. I don't resist change and neither does the average Joe. Everyone has pushed for major changes in his or her life. Many young people leave their homes, choose to get married, prefer children, and show me somebody who resists the change of a promotion at work. Can you really fool yourself that you don't resist change? I resist only the changes that I have a good reason to resist. The others I accept. Baloney! Try me. Okay, I'm game. Making a change is like climbing a mountain. Here's one. Climb it. Hmm... Don't think so. Haha, <laughs> you see? You do resist change. <laughs> I don't resist change. I resist this particular change because I don't have a reason to climb the mountain. I don't see the plus in the change. Hmm? Well, what's a good reason for you? Hmm? A higher salary, better health, or an improved relationship. Okay, I'll take care of your excuse. There's a pot of gold waiting for you up there. Is that good enough? Now will you climb? Um, nope. Point proven! You most certainly resist change. Of course I resist this change, and with good reason. See for yourself. Too much effort, too much time, too high a risk. Whoa! Ooh. Ooh. Uh, it's perfectly logical. The minus of the change outweighs the plus of the change. Another excuse. Fine. I'll reduce the required efforts and the risk. Now are you willing to climb? I don't think so. Aha! I knew it! Excuse after excuse. You remove one, another one pops up. The end result is still the same. The change is definitely good for you, and yet you still resist. But it's not good for me. I don't want the change because I'm comfortable in my current situation. Hmm. Ugh, another excuse. Not at all. You look at it too narrowly. No wonder people reject your suggestions. What? I looked at both the plus and the minus sides of making the change. Yes, but you've ignored the pluses of not changing. I like my profession. I like the city I'm in. I like my style of living. I like my... mermaid. But she cannot climb the mountain with me. You've just proved my point. Maybe you justified it logically, but at the end of the day, people will always resist change. They can simply declare that they have a mermaid, and there goes any chance of causing a change out the window. I'm not looking for excuses, but unlike you, I'm not in love with your suggested change. I'm more objective. Oh, so you're Mr. Objectivity, huh? The guy who only looks at the plus side of staying the same? Aren't there minuses as well? I guess there are. Hmm, think of situations that if things stay as they are, alligators will bite your ass off. Your firm may go bankrupt, or your spouse may ask for a divorce. Of all the nerve! Or your health will decline drastically. <laughs> Aren't you fighting alligators? Constantly! Sometimes I feel that the people I try to convince are so busy fighting off the alligators that they should be climbing the mountain even if there is no pot of gold waiting at the top. Still, everybody resists change, including you. Not at all. Show me how the pot is large enough for me, and the teeth of my alligator are sharp enough, and my effort and my risk to change is not as big, and that I don't have to give up on a beautiful mermaid, then, I assure you, I will climb the mountain. That's what I do, and it doesn't work. Really? Have you ever tried to present all four sides of your suggestion? Let me ask you a more pertinent question. Did you figure out in advance what the pot is for the person you're trying to convince? Not your pot, but his or her pot. What is his or her crutch? What are the alligators and the mermaids for the other party? I guess not. There you go. Also, when you concentrate on one aspect 
and the other person concentrates on another, you are bound to miscommunicate. Looking at all four factors and doing it from the other party's perspective sounds like a lot of preparation. Are you sure it'll pay off? Not if you believe the people are programmed to resist change, or any change. I guess I'll never know unless I give it a try. I'll let you know how it went. Share your experience. Post a video on YouTube.com titled, Overcoming Resistance to Change. Isn't it obvious? The video that has the most viewers by midnight GMT, September 19th, 2010, will win a $1,000 cash prize. But Paul, I see how it might work for convincing an individual, but it won't work when trying to introduce a full-scale organizational change, with the collaboration of so many people is needed. Yes, it will, as long as you recognize that for different individuals, each of the four elements might be vastly different. A lot more work, but who said that changing an organization is easy? Ellie Goldratt, the person who wrote The Goal, shares his experience on how to change a whole organization in his new book, Isn't It Obvious? We have all experienced change of some sort in our lives. It's not always something we like or want, but sometimes it is necessary. Here is an example. Well, go on, make a shape. No, no, some, something less abstract. No, something less silly. Give us something simple. Much better, well done. Now, this little guy represents any average person. Let's see what happens when we change his situation. Go on then, try to get through. I'll give you a hint. You'll never reach a bright future without making a change. Sometimes we want other people to change, but they resist. Often incentives are used to overcome this. Let's take a look. As we see, incentives are useful but realistically don't always work. Individuals have different needs and motivations that should be considered. Forcing change is never going to give you the desired win-win outcome. Let's consider why blue doesn't want to change. We can do that by using a very simple matrix. The positive of changing is a bright future, but what if blue can't relate to this concept? What happens if we make it more personal? Blue, you will be a star. No. It's okay, we aren't finished yet. Now, what are the negatives related to changing? No. For blue, it's cake. Blue hates cake. So how about if you get apples instead? Healthy and great for the waistline. Mm. We aren't going to stop there. 
let's also look at the positives and negatives of not changing. The positives of not changing is that you get to stay a square. <laughs> and you love being a square. No. But is being a square really that great? No. You have sharp edges and you're really slow no. compared to, let's say, a circle. No. Great, guys. I'm glad you could all agree. Enjoy your bright future. <laughs> Overcoming resistance to change? Isn't it obvious? Seventy percent of major change programs don't achieve the objectives they set out to. And when you look at that seventy percent that fail, what you find is that seventy percent of the time, it's because of the human issues, the organization issues, the culture issues. Sometimes it's the employees who don't really understand it or don't feel personally motivated to change. Sometimes it's because management's not on board. Sometimes it's because the top team isn't engaged. One of the organizations I've worked with recently, it's a large energy company. And the CEO was absolutely convinced that he had a very clear vision and strategy. So we organized the workshop and we used some of the anonymous voting machines. The first question we put up was, we have a clear and compelling strategy for our business. 100% of the people in the room voted yes. The second question we put up was, our strategy is, and we listed six completely different statements of where they could take that company. Each statement got two votes. At that point, the CEO blew up, left the room, but actually they needed to have a breakdown in order to get a breakthrough because that was the only way we could have an open and honest discussion about the fact they were all in completely different places and not surprisingly, were creating confusion and chaos in the organization because they were sending very, very different signals and messages. This video is very much about engaging with our clients, engaging with our colleagues to help them understand what some of the success factors are in really making change successful and sustainable over time. Many CEOs believe that common sense just needs to become common practice. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. If I give an example, one of the things that many CEOs do is they try to engage other people with what excites and inspires them personally. One of the CEOs I've been working with recently, he's the head of a major pharma company. And for him, the vision of where he wanted to take this company was he wanted to go and be number one. But when we started testing it with people across the organization, what we found was actually for a lot of the sales reps, frankly, being number one, yeah, fine. But it wasn't really what got them engaged. So over time, we worked with the CEO and we helped him develop a story where what he was gonna do was absolutely consistent everywhere, but why resonated with many, many different people. So he started talking about the fact that this was transforming medicine, finding cures for illnesses that are currently incurable. He talked about the journey that they would go on as a team continuing to grow in a period of major patent expiration. 
and he talked about the individual rewards that were going to come. And by doing all of this, they were going to be number one. And as I was sitting listening to him with 150 other people, what resonated for each of the people sitting at that table was something different. But each of them left motivated, excited, and passionate about making that vision a reality. There are at least five sources of meaning around society and mission, about the customer, about the company, about the team, and about me, about me personally. And as CEOs and senior executives engage on why this matters, it's really important to appeal to each of those five sources of meaning. We looked at the S&P 500, and one of the interesting things, if you look at 1935, is the average lifespan of a company on that list was 90 years. If you fast forward to 2010, that average lifespan has dropped to only 14 years. Half of the companies on the list in 2010 will not be there in 2017. Now, they won't all go bust, but what it does mean is the necessity of being able to change yourself. Perhaps one of the classic examples is the Italian Postal Service. They hadn't made a profit in half a century. Their quality standards were so low, they didn't achieve the minimum on the European standard scale. And yet, in the, in the period of about three or four years, they went from that initial starting point to being the third largest financial services institution in Italy. Now, it's that kind of transformation where there's no going back, where it's a radical step change in skills and mindsets and capabilities and processes. That's what we're trying to achieve. When we look at a transformation, we typically think about five frames. The first one is being really clear about where are you going. It's about Aspire. What's your vision? What's your strategy? What are the targets? And how do you create a really compelling story that's going to engage your organization? If you're not very clear on those targets, your chance of success isn't 30%, which is the average. It's actually only 12%. Where you have very clearly defined targets, you more than double your chances of success. Once you've gone through the Aspire phase, it's then critical to assess. When organizations actually spend the time to really look hard at whether they have the capabilities to succeed and whether they have the mindsets to succeed, they're between four and six times more likely to be successful. The third step is to architect. So once you have a clear vision of where you want to go and you know where you are today, you then need to create a plan that's going to get you from here to there. It's also about how do you change individuals? What we found is that there are four things that need to be in place. The first one is they have to understand why they have to change and it has to mean something to them individually. The second thing is all the systems and processes need to be in place to reinforce the new set of behaviors. The third lever is they have to have the skills to do it. And then the fourth lever, which actually is the most powerful of all, is the role modeling. So people they trust and respect, people they admire, have to behave in the new way too. I'd like to just emphasize that last one because according to all the research, it is the most important. One of the CEOs that we've worked with, who's the head of a, a major bank, he was driving a transformation program around customer focus. And he goes into one of the retail branches and he notices that the windows are dirty. And so he mentions this to the staff. The next morning when he comes back, he notices that the windows are still dirty. And he rolls up his sleeves and he starts washing the windows in front of every single member of that retail branch. Within two days, there is not a dirty window in any of the retail branches anywhere in the country. So now that you've architected your plan, you now need to act. And typically what we find is that transformations are a journey. They often start with a big burst of enthusiasm and excitement. And then typically what you find, sometimes six months, sometimes 12 months in, is that there's a dip. It gets really hard. Energy starts to flag. Results may not come through quite as quickly as you want. And what's really important is to make sure that you've got things that will create energy, that will give momentum, that will give people confidence they're heading in the right direction. It takes having a, a story that cuts through the noise. It takes having some quick wins. Sometimes it means stopping things. And sometimes it actually means being willing to make tough decisions on people. Last but not least is advance. A transformation is a phenomenal opportunity to build skills to develop leaders, to make sure that you've got your best talent focused on the most critical issues for your business. So when change really works, you can go in and you can look and touch it and feel it. You can see people who are excited, who are passionate, who are doing things they never thought possible, who genuinely believe in the power and the impact of what they've done and feel like they have personally grown tremendously from the experience. 
Uh, one of the clients I work with, they have seen their share price literally increase by five times in the last five years. You walk into the organization and everybody is incredibly motivated and excited and passionate about their jobs. It's that feeling, it's that sensation that you can, it's, it's hard to describe, but when you experience it, you never forget it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank mm -hmm. you.